Hello and welcome to Introduction to OSHA, a workplace safety presentation by Tech Training LLC. In this presentation, we're going to be discussing the history of OSHA as well as the history of workplace accidents. We'll also be discussing the benefits of implementing an appropriate safety program. We'll go through the painful statistics involved in the construction industry and the most cited violations by OSHA inspectors. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. In response to dangerous working conditions across the nation, and as a culmination of decades of reform, the bipartisan williams Steiger Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970 was signed into law by President Richard M. Nixon. This law led to multiple organizations, including, of course, OSHA, but it also established the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, and the Independent Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission. The Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970 was passed to prevent workers from being killed and seriously injured in the workplace. The law requires employers to provide their employees with working conditions that are free of hazards and known dangers. OSHA establishes and enforces protective workplace safety and health standards. It was officially enacted on April 28, 1971. OSHA also provides information, training, and assistance to workers and employers. Workers may file a complaint to have OSHA inspect their workplace if they believe their employer is not following OSHA standards or that they believe their workplace contains serious hazardous conditions. OSHA is part of the United States Department of Labor. The Administrator for OSHA is the Assistant Secretary of Labor. The Secretary of Labor is a Cabinet Member for the President of the United States. Federally, OSHA is a small agency. However, it does have state partners and therefore has approximately 2,200 inspectors responsible for the health and safety of over 130 million workers. These workers are employed at more than 8 million work sites across the nation. This translates to about one compliance officer for every 59,000 workers. OSHA's fiscal year budget for the year 2014 was $552,247,000. There was a slight increase in the fiscal year 2015 to $552,787,000 and no increase for the fiscal year 2016. As for inspections, fiscal year 2015 saw total federal inspections at 35,820. If we include state planned inspections, this number increases to 43,471. So what brought on OSHA? In 1913, there were 23,000 industrial deaths reported. Again, this was 1913 and not all work accidents were reported at the time. However, there were approximately 38 million U.S. workers. This number only grew. From 1935 to 1960, when more than 400,000 workers were killed on the job. But OSHA is making a difference. In the four decades since OSHA was signed into law, OSHA, along with their state partners, coupled with the efforts of employers, safety and health advocates, as well as unions and workers, have had a dramatic effect on workplace safety. Since 1970, workplace fatalities have been reduced by more than 65%, and occupational injuries and illness rates have declined by more than 67%. At the same time, U.S. employment has more than doubled. 
Worker deaths in America are down on average from about 38 workers per day in 1970 to 13 per day in the year 2014. And worker injury and illnesses are down from 10.9 incidents per 100 workers in 1972 to 3 per 100 in the year 2015. These numbers are positive, but they're nothing to brag about. One death, one injury, one illness is far too many. So who is covered by OSHA? Most employees in the United States come under OSHA's jurisdiction. OSHA covers private sector employees and employees in all 50 states and the District of Columbia and other U.S. jurisdiction territories directly through the federal OSHA program or through an OSHA-approved state program. State-run health and safety programs must be at least as effective as the federal OSHA program to qualify. Now, employees who work for state and local governments are not covered by federal OSHA, but do have Occupational Safety and Health Act protection if they work in a state that has an OSHA-approved state program. Four additional states and one U.S. territory have OSHA-approved programs that cover public sector employees only. This includes Connecticut, Illinois, New Jersey, New York, and the Virgin Islands. Private sector workers in these four states and the Virgin Islands are covered by federal OSHA. And federal agencies must have a safety and health program that meets the same standards as private employees. Although OSHA does not find federal agencies, it does monitor federal agencies and responds to workers' complaints. The United States Postal Service is covered by OSHA. And now is a good time to mention the General Duty Clause. The General Duty Clause is written into the Occupational Safety and Health Act. It is Public Law 91-596. And it states that both the employer and the employee must comply with OSHA. The General Duty Clause states that each employer shall furnish to each of his or her employees employment and a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or are likely to cause death or serious physical harm to his or her employees. It also states that all employers shall comply with the occupational safety and health standards promulgated under this act. Now employees are not free of responsibility. Each employee shall comply with occupational safety and health standards and shall follow all rules, regulations, and orders issued pursuant to this act, which are applicable to his or her own actions and conduct. And now, with this background, let's move on and talk specifically about the construction industry. Construction is a high-hazard industry that comprises a wide range of activities. It may involve demolition, alterations, renovations, and repair. Most people in this industry are in the industry because they have a passion for it. They're professionals and understand the hazards that they face every day. Many of those hazards they can see. They understand the potential for falls, the potential of unguarded equipment or being struck by heavy construction equipment. Unfortunately, many of those hazards are not visible, such things as silica dust or asbestos. The information and the resources provided in this presentation are hopefully going to assist those in this industry, whether they be workers or employers, to identify and reduce and hopefully eliminate construction-related hazards. And there is no better place to start than with the construction industry's fatal four. Of the 4,386 worker fatalities in private industry in the calendar year of 2014, 899, or 20.5%, were in construction. 
the fatal four were responsible for more than half, or 60.6%, of the construction worker deaths in the calendar year of 2014. And number one on the fatal four list? Falls. 359 of the 899 total deaths in the construction year 2014 were caused by falls. That's 359 of our fellow workers perished from this one hazard. Next up, electrocutions. 74 people killed by electrocutions. After that, struck by an object. 73 people. And last, caught in between. 39 fellow workers killed by this hazard. Just imagine if we could eliminate these four accidents. That would be 545 people returning home to their families at the end of every day, every year. So now, let's review what OSHA has found to be 2015's top 10 most frequently cited violations. Not surprisingly, number one is fall protection, obviously directly related to the fatal four. The C at the end of fall protection represents that this is a specific construction standard. Number two, hazard communication, getting the message out a big problem on the construction site and in the construction industry. Number three, also a construction standard, scaffolding. Number four, respiratory protection. This is especially important when we're talking about silica dust. Respiratory protection protects you from unseen hazards. Number five, lockout, tagout. Number six, powered industrial trucks obviously associated to being struck by another one of the fatal fours. Ladders, a construction standard. Also, electrical wiring. Number nine, machine guarding. And number 10, electrical. Here we're talking about general electrical requirements. Now we've already discussed that OSHA is the law but let's take a look at the breakdown of these violations. And let's start with number 10, electrical. Again, general requirements. This is OSHA standard 1910.303. Total violations for the fiscal year 2015 was 2,181. Some of the top sections that were cited was installation and use of equipment. Also, not surprisingly, the space around electrical equipment. This can be identified as a hazard on almost any job site that you visit. The previous year, the fiscal year 2014, the ranking for this violation was also number 10 with 2,427 cited violations. Next up, number nine, machine guarding OSHA standard 1910.212. Total violations for 2015 was 2,540. Not surprisingly, one of the top violations was types of guarding. It is highly recommended that you stick with manufactured recommended guarding. If you question that guarding, you can always ask the manufacturer if this guarding is OSHA approved. If it is, then stick with that guarding and you can avoid this violation. This is the same ranking as 2014, it was number nine, and again, slightly more violations in 2015 than 2014, as 2014 had 2,520 violations. Number eight, electrical again. This is wiring methods, 1910.305. Total violations for the year 2015 was 2,624. Of the top cited violations, use of flexible cords and cables. This is category G14A, 447 violations. This one is becoming more and more common as people are using incorrect types of cords and cables. Be sure to verify that you're using the correct cable. In fiscal year 2014, its ranking was also number eight, 
but it had 2,907 violations, so 2015 saw a decrease of almost 300 violations, an overall improvement in the year 2015. Number seven, ladders, OSHA standard 1926.1053, total violations for 2015, 2,732. And number one cited violation in this category, requirements for the ladder. This is accessing upper landing surfaces. This is a short climb, and what people do is they'll grab a pallet, they'll grab a plank, They'll grab something along those lines and use it as their ladder. This was cited 1,866 times. The 2014 ranking for this category was number seven, so no change. But again, the positive side, a slight decrease. In 2014, there were 2,967 violations, again, compared to the 2,732 of 2015. Number six, powered industrial trucks, 1910.178, total violations, 3,004, over 3,000 violations, and the number one violation, ensuring competency of the powered industrial truck operator. Now, you may recall that one of the fatal four was struck by, and here this violation was cited 544 times, incompetent powered industrial truck operators cited in the year 2015. That's a scary number considering the fatal four. The 2014 ranking was number five, so it's dropped back a bit. I suppose that's a positive sign, and the number of violations has dropped a bit from 3,147 in 2014. But again, these are directly related to the fatal four and have to be corrected. Next, lockout tagout, 1910.147. This was number five on the 2015 list. This standard outlines minimum performance requirements for the control of hazardous energy during servicing and maintenance of machines and equipment. Total violations for the year 2015, 3,308. This is an increase from 2014, where there was 3,117 violations Furthermore, this violation has moved up in the rankings, number six in 2014, moving in the wrong direction at number five for 2015. Next is number four, respiratory protection, standard 1910.134. This standard directs employers on how to establish and maintain a respiratory protection program. It lists requirements for program administration, worksite specific procedures, respiratory selection, employee training, fit testing, medical evaluation, and respiratory use. It also covers maintenance and repair of respirators. OSHA cited this standard in the year 2015, 3,626 times. This, again, is a slight decrease, a slight improvement over the year 2014, where it was cited 3,843 times. Number three, scaffolding, standard 1926.451. Total violations in 2015, 4,681. And take a look at the number one issue in this sector. It was employee fall protection cited the most times at 788 and again i want to remind you the number one in the fatal four was in fact falls this is a slight improvement over 2014 where the ranking still remained number three but was cited 4968 times number two is hazard communications 1910.1200 this standard addresses chemical hazards produced in the workplace and imported into the workplace. It also governs the communication of those hazards to workers. This particular violation was cited 5,681 times in the year 2015. Its ranking in 2014 was in fact number two when it was cited 6,148 times. Again, a slight improvement over 
2014. And number one cited in the year 2015, again, was full protection 1926.501. This is also the number one in the fatal four falls. This standard outlines when fall protection is required, which systems are appropriate for given situations. It also covers the proper construction and the installation of the safety systems and the proper supervision of employees to prevent falls. It is designed to protect employees on walking or working surfaces, horizontal or vertical, with an unprotected side or edge higher than just six feet. According to OSHA's top 10 most frequently cited violations of 2015, again, this was number one ranking fall protection, cited 7,402 times, and unfortunately, it was also number one in 2014, being cited 7,516 times. Now, to show that these were not simply minor incidents, check out these statistics. Here is a list of what was considered a serious violation of the top 10. A serious violation is defined by OSHA as one in which there is an imminent substantial probability that death or serious physical harm could result, and the employer knew or should have known of that hazard. And here is the list. If you take a look, number one again obviously falls, but 6,173 of those violations were considered serious. And check out these numbers. These are willful violations. Willful violations are violations that are committed with an intentional disregard or plain indifference to the requirements of the OSHA standards and requirements. Now here's a sad reality. Hazards exist on every construction site in many different forms. Sharp edges, falling objects, flying sparks, chemicals, noise, and a host of other potentially dangerous situations. OSHA requires that employers protect their employees from workplace hazards that can cause injury. Controlling a hazard at its source is the best way to protect the employees. Depending upon the situation and the workplace conditions, OSHA recommends the use of engineering or work practice controls to manage or eliminate hazards to the greatest extent possible. For example, building a barrier between the hazard and the employee is an example of an engineering control. Changing the way in which employees perform their work is a work practice control. When engineering or work practice controls and administration controls are not feasible or do not provide sufficient protection, employers must provide employees with personal protective equipment or PPE. Personal protective equipment is equipment worn to minimize the exposure to a variety of hazards. These injuries and illnesses may result from coming in contact with chemicals, biologics, physical, electrical, mechanical, or other workplace hazards. Personal protective equipment may include items such as gloves, safety glasses, and safety shoes, earplugs or earmuffs, hard hats, respirators, coveralls, vests, and in some cases, full body suits. So what can be done to help ensure the proper use of personal protective equipment? Well, all personal protective equipment should be of safe design and construction and should be maintained in a clean and reliable fashion. It should fit well and be comfortable to wear. This will encourage workers to use it. If personal protective equipment does not fit properly, it can make the difference between being safely covered or dangerously exposed. When engineering, work practices, and administrative controls are not feasible or do not provide feasible protection, employers must provide personal protective equipment to their employees. 
but they must also ensure its proper use. Employers must also require and train each worker for the following. When is it necessary to wear personal protective equipment? What kind of PPE is required? The limitations of the PPE, the proper care, maintenance, and the useful life as well as the disposal of the personal protective equipment. Now, whether you are an employee or an employer, you should be interested in some of the general safety and health provisions involved with personal protective equipment. This falls under 1926.28. The employer is responsible for requiring wear of all appropriate personal protective equipment in operations where there is exposure to hazardous conditions. 1926.28b Regulations governing the use, selection, and maintenance of personal protective equipment and life-saving equipment are described under subpart E of this section. 1926.95a Protective equipment including PPE for eyes, face, head, extremities, etc. shall be provided used and maintained in a sanitary and reliable condition. Now we realize that some of these regulations are extremely dull, but this next one is important as we've seen many arguments erupt between workers and supervisors on various construction sites. And it is related to employee-owned personal protective equipment. And it is in OSHA under 1926.95 Part B. And it states, where employees provide their own personal protective equipment, the employer shall be responsible to assure its adequacy, including proper maintenance, sanitation of such equipment. 1926.95 Part C is design, and design states that all personal protective equipment shall be of safe design and construction for the work which is to be performed. Next up is training 1926.21 and training is the employer's responsibility. The employer shall instruct each employee in the recognition and the avoidance of unsafe conditions and the regulations applicable to their work environment to control or eliminate any hazardous or other exposure to illness or injury. To be clear on the payment of personal protective equipment, it is 1926.95 Part D, and it states, except as noted, the protective equipment used to comply with this section shall be provided by the employer at no cost to the employee. Occupational Protective Footwear is 1926.96, obviously a biggie on every construction site. It states that safety toe footwear for employees shall meet the requirements and the specifications in American National Standard for Men's Safety Toe Footwear. This is ANSI Z41.1-1967. Head protection is 1926.100 Part A, and it states that employees working in areas where there is a possible danger of head injury from impact or from falling or flying objects or from electrical shock and burns shall be protected by helmets. And those helmets must meet some specifications, and they fall under 1926-100 Part B. Helmets for protection of employees against impact and penetration of falling or flying objects shall meet the specifications contained in American National Standard Institute, ANSI, Z89.1-1969 Safety Requirements, for industrial head protection. And if you are in an occupation which exposes you to high voltage electrical shock, 
then the specification is slightly different. Here, the head protection must meet specifications contained in American National Standards Institute Z89.2-1971. Next up is 1926.101A hearing protection. Wherever it is not feasible to reduce the noise levels or duration of exposure to those specified in Table D2, permissible noise exposures in 1926.52, ear protection devices shall be provided and used. Now when ear protection devices are inserted into the ear, they shall be fitted and determined individually by competent persons. And this is a good time to mention that stuffing cotton into someone's ears is not acceptable hearing protection. Eye and face protection 1926.102 Employees shall be provided with eye and face protection equipment when machines or operations present potential eye or face injuries from physical, chemical, or radiation agents. Safety glasses or face shields are worn any time that work operations can cause foreign objects to get into the eye. For example, during welding, cutting, grinding, nailing, or when working with concrete or harmful chemicals. Eye and face protection should also be worn whenever there's going to be exposure to any electrical hazards, including working on energized electrical systems. Eye and face protection should be selected based on the anticipated hazards. Eye and face protection equipment required by 1926.102 shall meet the requirements specified in the American National Institute's standards Z89.1-1968 practice for occupational and educational eye and face protection. Employees whose vision requires the use of corrective lenses in spectacles when required by this regulation to wear eye protection shall be protected by goggles or spectacles. When wearing goggles or spectacles, they must meet the following specifications. The spectacles must have protective lenses which provide the optical correction. The goggles that are going to be worn with the corrective spectacles must be worn without disturbing or adjusting the spectacles. And lastly, if the goggles are going to have corrective lenses, the corrective lenses must be incorporated and mounted behind the protective lenses. Respiratory disease is the silent killer of the construction industry, and therefore respiratory protection is taken very seriously. Respiratory protection falls under OSHA 1926.103, but is identical to the Code of Federal Regulations 1910.134. When respiratory protection is required, it must come with a written program, medical evaluations, fit testing, selection and use of respirator, maintenance and care, training, program evaluation, and record keeping. Next is 1926.104 Safety Belts, Lifelines, and Lanyards. Lifelines, safety belts, and lanyards shall be used only for employee safeguarding. Lifelines shall be secured above the point of operation to an anchorage or structural member capable of supporting a minimum dead weight load of 5,400 pounds. Lifelines used on rock scaling operations or in areas where the lifeline may be subject to abrasion or cutting shall be a minimum of 7 eighths of an inch wire core manila rope. For all other lifeline applications, a minimum of 3 quarters of an inch manila or equivalent with a minimum breaking strength of 5,400 pounds shall be used. 
Safety belt lanyards shall be a minimum of one half inch nylon or equivalent with a maximum length to provide for a fall of no greater than six feet. Furthermore, the rope shall have a nominal breaking strength of 5,400 pounds. All safety belt and lanyard hardware shall be drop forged or pressed steel in accordance with Type 1 Class B plating specified in the Federal Specifications QQP-416. All safety belt and lanyard hardware except rivets shall be capable of withstanding a tensile loading of 4,000 pounds without cracking, breaking, or taking a permanent deformation. Safety nets shall be provided when workplaces are more than 25 feet above the ground or water surfaces, or other surfaces where the use of scaffolds, catch platforms, temporary floors, safety lines, or safety belts are simply impractical. When safety nets are required, operations shall not be undertaken until the net is in place and has been tested. Nets shall extend 8 feet beyond the edge of the working surface, where employees are exposed and shall be installed as close under the work surface as possible. It is intended that only one level of nets be required for bridge construction. All nets shall meet a performance standard of 17,500 foot-pounds minimum impact resistance as determined and certified by the manufacturers and shall bear a label of proof test. Forged steel Safety hooks and shackles shall be used to fasten the net to its supports. Also, connections between net panels shall develop the full strength of the net. Working over or near the water is 1926.106, and it states that life jackets or buoyant work vests must be approved by the United States Coast Guard. Also, prior to and after any use, the buoyant work vests or the life preservers shall be inspected for defects. Ring buoys shall be provided for rescue. And also, life-saving skiff shall be immediately available. Construction fatalities rose to 874 in 2014, up from 828 in 2013. The number of fatal injuries in construction in 2014 was the highest reported total since 2008. The total injury rate for workers in the private construction industry was 9.5 per 100,000 full-time employee workers in 2014 and 9.7 per 100,000 full-time employee workers in 2013. Heavy and civil engineering construction recorded a series low of 138 fatal injuries in the year 2014, down from 165 in 2013. Now there is no question that starting a job site safety program is difficult. There are those who believe that it is all about compliance. There's those who believe it's all about saving money. There's even workers who believe that safety programs are designed to simply get rid of people on the job site that the supervisor doesn't like. Now in some very rare cases, this may be true. But let's take a look at why you should be interested in a job site safety program. And let's start with the difference between an accident and an incident. Accidents are unexpected, unplanned, and uncontrollable. Now many people say this simply isn't true. Accidents are controllable. They are not controllable. They are preventable, but they are not controllable. Once they begin, they take on a life of their own. Accidents can cause physical injury, property damage, and equipment loss. 
Now an incident can come close to causing physical injury, property damage, or equipment loss. And many people say, well, isn't that the same thing? Well, it is, except incidents go unreported, and incidents are the key to preventing accidents. If we address incidents before they cause loss or injury, we're going to take a big step forward in preventing accidents. The interaction between workers, equipment, management, and machines are complex enough. But even more complexity is added in when all of these things come together to form the workplace. Now, those in the construction industry may be used to this type of complexity, but now add in the unexpected problems that you may be bringing from home. Perhaps you're preoccupied with a sick family member, or maybe even an old friend. And what about peer pressure on the job site? Or perhaps you've got an unexpected bill. And when all of these things come together on the job site, we have an accident. So what can be done? We've already discussed the history of OSHA, but what about some of the other benefits of OSHA? First, the company is going to receive lower industrial insurance costs. The more you comply with OSHA, the fewer compliance inspections there are. A safer job site means reduced litigation, reduced legal fees, and less settlements. And finally, there are going to be significantly lower indirect costs for the company which means more profit and more money for the workers. But the biggest reason that you should want to be part of a workplace safety program is there is less potential for personal injury. And less injury to you means less anguish for your friends and less anguish for your family. So now, let's review recognizing avoiding and correcting hazards. And let's begin with helping ourselves and others. To do this, we're going to focus on three key areas. Those areas are the physical environment in which we work, the social environment, and the systems that we use to report and correct incidents and accidents. Now in the section on physical environment, we're going to be talking about how to identify actual hazards. On the construction site, there are many potential hazards. Some are visible and some are not visible. But the question becomes, what is a real hazard and what is a perceived hazard? Also, what is true safety and what is perceived as safety? And lastly, we have to ask, can something so little cause any serious injury? Well, we're going to find out. Next, we're going to take a look at the social environment of the construction site and the attitudes towards safety. We're going to ask the following questions. Who is responsible for safety? Why is there so much negativity about safety? And in reality, isn't safety just all about compliance? And lastly, we're going to take a look at the systems that we use on the construction site. And we're going to try to inject two things immediately into the job site, peer keeping and reporting. Now earlier in this presentation, we discussed the statistics of injuries in the construction industry. And those statistics are not pretty. Construction continues to be number one or number two for deaths in the workplace. With this in mind, let's move forward with one focus and one clearly stated goal, that no one ever gets hurt. Now, just a few minutes ago, we said that starting a safety program was difficult because there's those who believe it's all about compliance, others who believe it's all about money, and workers who believe that safety is nothing more than a management tool. But this simple statement removes all politics it removes all company grievances, it removes all worker grievances, and focuses on one single goal, that no one ever gets hurt. All too often, an accident occurs on the construction site, and it's reported, recorded, 
and hopefully correct it. But then most of us move on with our lives. But for the injured person and their family, they have to continue to live with that injury every day. In many cases, they have to become overnight attorneys just to find out what benefits they're entitled to. Or they have to learn new skills and new training just to continue on with their lives. Now to reach this goal, we must build, for lack of a better expression, a solid foundation. The mere fact that you're watching this video now some 45 minutes into the video suggests that you do want to make a change on the job site. Now the reality is, is that every work site and every worker is slightly different, which makes many hazards unique. Therefore, what we hope to accomplish here is to give you the tools that are going to develop a safe environment. Hopefully you can gain cooperation and encourage the sharing of ideas and a call for new ideas. Furthermore, we hope to encourage safe behavior on every job site. And hopefully you'll be able to build and establish safety systems that work for you and your coworkers. So let's go ahead and get started with helping ourselves and others. We're going to begin by focusing on the physical environment in which we work. Now, as we said, every construction site is unique, which means that every hazard is unique as well. So here we're going to be focusing on three main areas. Being aware of hazardous environments, avoiding hazardous activities, and finally, wearing our personal protective equipment. And let's start here in the job trailer. So often when it comes time for construction safety, many people want to run onto the job site and point fingers at the workers. But what about the example that's being set right inside the job trailer? Many times, the very people responsible for safety hardly represent a safe environment. What are some of the hazards that you can see here? You have a tripping hazard. You have overloaded electrical equipment. You have poorly stored chemicals. You have virtually a potpourri of accidents just waiting to happen. But this does not exonerate the workers. How many problems do you see here? Or here? Or here? Well, we're going to revisit our three buddies here as well as the job trailer in a few minutes. But for now, what we'd like to do is show you how a simple event can cause a catastrophic accident. This is what we refer to as the pyramid of hazard identification. And sometimes to identify a hazard, we must use a little imagination. So let's assume that we have a little bit of soap on the floor. Is this a hazard? Well, of course. But let's imagine what exactly could possibly happen from a little soap on the floor. Could someone slip on the soap and then not report it? or not clean it up themselves? If so, this is an incident. Remember, an incident is close to an accident, but it goes unreported and uncorrected. So could this happen? Absolutely. Now, since the soap wasn't cleaned up, could a person slip on the soap and hurt their back? And it's just a minor injury, so they go on back to work and continue to work throughout the day, and eventually the pain goes away because it was a minor fall. But could somebody slip and break an arm? Absolutely. And now we have a lost time accident with an employee in severe pain and an employee who is going to have to make adjustments in their life to compensate for that broken arm. All because the soap wasn't cleaned up. And even worse... Could that little bit of soap on the floor result in a death? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. And all of this could have been avoided had someone just taken a moment to clean up the soap. If they didn't have the available equipment to clean up the soap, they could have marked off the area so that nobody else would slip on the soap until they can notify the proper people to come over and clean up the soap. Now, if a little soap on the floor can cause such injury, just imagine how many things we probably pass by on the job site every day that could be corrected.
Now that we have a basic understanding of hazard awareness, let's take a look at avoiding dangerous activities. Now, though it's easy to say avoid dangerous activities on the job site, it's much easier said than done. We have dangerous activities going on around us every day on a regular basis. But there are precautions and steps that we can take to minimize the dangers and to protect ourselves and others. So let's take a look at this situation. We're going to use a cartoon here for reasons that you'll see in a moment. But here, the welder is working safely. He set up his own area off to the side away from his co-workers because he knows he's going to be doing dangerous work. Furthermore, he's wearing all of the proper personal protective equipment. But the gentleman who has approached him is not wearing the proper PPE. In fact, the welder probably doesn't even know that the gentleman has approached as he's focused on his work. And when this situation arises, almost anything can happen. Now, if what this gentleman needed to say to the welder was so important that it couldn't wait, he should have approached the welder from his visible side, waited until the welder acknowledged him, and let him know that it was safe to approach. The welder may actually take this opportunity to let the gentleman know that he's concerned about his safety and that in the future, when he comes to approach, be sure to be wearing the proper PPE. And we realize that personal protective equipment can annoy some people, and in some cases it may seem like overkill. But the reality is, is that a great deal of thought goes into personal protective equipment. And the PPE required on the job is meant to protect you. And unfortunately, in many cases, PPE requirements are the direct result of an accident. That is why reporting incidents is so important. Now, if you don't know the PPE requirements for a particular task, ask a supervisor. A good supervisor will know the PPE requirements for every task, and if they don't, they will at least know where to go to get the answer. So don't forget your personal protective equipment. And at a minimum, every job site should be equipped with at least the basics. Hard hats, vests, glasses, dust masks, hearing protection, and gloves. Next, let's take a look at our attitudes towards safety. And let's begin with agreeing that safety is indeed everyone's responsibility. Remember our pyramid? Well, had the first person who saw that soap stopped and cleaned it up, we never would have moved up the pyramid. Now granted, some people may not have realized how big of a hazard a little bit of soap can be, but there were others who thought, not my job, why should I bother, and moved on. This is a bad attitude. And where does that bad attitude come from? If you're in construction, you're probably familiar with the pink hard hat punishment. This is when a worker forgets to bring their hard hat to the job site, and they're forced to wear a pink hard hat all day long. And though it may be funny and it may be cute, what is that worker's attitude going to be towards safety, positive or negative? The message that was just sent to that worker, as well as to all of the other workers on the job site, is that the supervisor could care less about their personal safety, and instead what they're concerned about is compliance. Now, we're not saying that compliance isn't important. It is. There are a number of construction companies that get huge fines from OSHA and other regulatory agencies. But compliance is far more easily achieved on a construction site that is filled with employees who have positive attitudes towards safety. Just imagine the difference had that supervisor called in the employee who forgot their hard hat and said, Hey, Bill, here's a hard hat, regular color, but don't forget you was tomorrow. I don't want to see you get hurt, and I don't want to be the one that has to tell your family you were hurt. Now, with the soap on the floor scenario still fresh in our mind, and the hard hat scenario still fresh in our mind, what do you suppose it is that this guy could do as he walks through this construction site? Take a look and see if you can identify how many little items he could clean up pretty quickly and pretty easily that are, in fact, safety hazards.
Well, one obvious hazard here is that this gentleman is not wearing a hard hat. But there's also these masonry blocks that could be stacked, and that hose could be wrapped up more properly. Furthermore, the fire extinguisher isn't hung, and experience tells us that once an extinguisher comes down off the hook, it just moves further and further away from where it's supposed to be. So when a fire does occur, nobody can find the fire extinguisher. And how long would it take to clean this up? How long would it take to have a safer work environment? Two minutes? Maybe three? The right attitude can produce a better, safer work environment. Now there are still other attitudinal issues that need to be addressed on the construction site. Did you ever meet this guy? The supervisor who uses safety as an opportunity to pass out pink slips to people he doesn't like? Or the worker who insists that management isn't taking safety seriously unless they install a $17 billion ventilation system into the port john Or the supervisor who uses safety as an opportunity to tell everyone they're stupid. These kind of individuals create negative attitudes on the job site. But, believe it or not, there's something that can be done. One of the most effective tools that can be implemented into any safety program is peer keeping. As the old saying goes, two heads are better than one. Peer keeping should be implemented whenever you feel that somebody is doing something unsafe. This isn't just for supervisors, but also for coworkers, friends, and visitors to the site. The peer keeping process is meant to be simple and therefore it is a simple four step process. If you feel that somebody is doing something unsafely or something that may cause harm to themselves or others, you should observe that individual just to ensure that they are indeed doing something unsafe. Remember, none of us are experts on every task. Next, before you comment on what you feel the person is doing unsafely, comment positively on something that the person is doing safely or properly. As an example, you might say, it's great that you're wearing your hard hat, but doesn't this task require safety glasses as well? And by mentioning the safety glasses, you've taken step number three in the peer keeping process. You've identified what you feel they are doing which is unsafe or improper. Lastly, and probably most importantly, do not walk away if the person has other safety concerns. If they want to discuss another safety issue, you have an obligation to stay and listen to that issue. Again, if you walk away, they're going to feel your only interest is compliance and not safety. So let's go ahead and give this a shot. Remember our buddy who was lugging all the wood? Well, after observing him for a moment, we can see that clearly he's struggling and clearly this is unsafe. So you might start off by saying, hey, it's obvious you're a hard worker and you're a safe worker. You're wearing your hard hat. But is there a better way to lug this wood from point A to point B? If they say no, then offer a better way or offer to lend a hand. And lastly, if they want to discuss some other safety issue or even discuss this safety issue further, then stay and listen, offer recommendations or potential changes to make the job safer. You never know what reaction you might get. Okay, this reaction might be a bit of an exaggeration, but you have a much better chance of this person reacting positively as opposed to negatively. Next, remember our supervisor with the disastrous office, all of the hazards that we identified here? There was the poorly stored chemicals, the overloaded electrical outlets, and the tripping hazards. What could you do here using peer keeping? And remember, you're probably talking to the supervisor, perhaps even your supervisor. Now again, here, step one is observe, and we've already observed and know that there are hazards in this office. 
So therefore, our next step would be to state something positive, which is going to set the tone for the conversation. So here, you might say something to the effect of, you know, boss, you do a great job of safety out on the job site, but frankly, the office could use a little help. I can help you store these chemicals more properly, and maybe we need another electrical line in here so that this outlet isn't overloaded. And go from there. Perhaps the boss is going to say, I saw something on the job site the other day I didn't like. Again, stay, discuss the issue, and then move on. The key to peer keeping is setting a positive tone for the discussion. So again, step one is observe the worker. Don't startle the worker. If we startle the worker, they may injure themselves or they may injure us. Step two, comment positively on something that the worker is doing. If we start off like our angry supervisor calling someone stupid, they're most likely going to respond by calling us stupid. Now we have two people arguing over who's stupid and nobody's focused on safety. Step three, suggest a safer process. Or if there's no way to improve the process, recommend personal protective equipment for the employee. And finally, step four, listen to other concerns that the employee, the supervisor, the staff member, or even the visitor may have regarding safety. Lastly, let's talk about the safety systems that we use on our job sites. Now, as we said earlier, every job site is different. Some job sites might have a discussion every morning before any work begins. Other companies might use lunchbox talks. And others still will use simpler reporting tools to identify hazards and unsafe conditions. If your job site has no systems in place, create one. And the most important thing is that the system is clear, consistent, and predictable. Remember our buddy with the $17 billion ventilation system? Well, if he files a concern and it's not addressed, his attitude is going to be more negative than ever. Even worse, he's now armed with a broken promise. He had a promise that all safety concerns would be addressed and his was not addressed. And he's going to be more than willing to discuss it with coworkers. And if one person on the site feels that the safety program is just a shell, it simply won't take much more to convince others. So make your system predictable. And if somebody files a safety concern for a ventilation system in a port john Take the time to explain that yes, it's inconvenient, but to install a ventilation system is simply not feasible. You may be surprised at the response. Next, your safety system should always promote new ideas because the job site is also constantly changing. The conditions in which construction takes place changes daily and in many cases, changes without predictability. Never squash an idea or crush somebody's thoughts. If you do, chances are you'll never get another new idea. And lastly, promote these ideas because you never know who might have one. As part of your safety system, always discourage unsafe acts and unsafe behaviors. This lets everyone know on the job site that you're serious about safety and they are more comfortable to discuss it and point out unsafe acts and conditions. In conclusion, remember, if you see a safety hazard and you cannot correct it, then you can report it. In the meantime, place a warning sign or some other type of barricade around the unsafe area. This lets everyone know that there's a potential hazard. And never ignore an unsafe act, behavior, or condition. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a sad and unfortunate update. While making this video, the Bureau of Labor Statistics released their 2015 fatality rates in the construction industry. I personally hate referring to these people as rates, as statistics, 
or as numbers. Every one of them was a co-worker, a friend, a mother or a father, a son or a daughter, a brother or a sister. And the sad news is this, that in 2015, construction job site deaths rose to a seven-year high. Furthermore, the industry's fatality rate also rose, which means the number of workers per 100,000 increased as well as the overall number. This means that even if you wanted to look at these numbers statistically, we're doing more poorly today than we did in previous years. The Bureau of Labor Statistics report, which was released on December 16, 2016, stated that construction deaths climbed 4% to 937, the most since 2008, when the industry recorded 975 fatalities. The Bureau of Labor Statistics also said that construction's 2015 fatality rate increased to 10.1 per 100,000 full-time construction workers, up from 9.8 in 2014. The report went on to say that one of the main factors for the increase is an increase in the amount of fatalities amongst specialty trades. It found that foundation workers, structure workers, and building exterior contractors had an increase in construction fatalities of 27%. Organizations such as AGC, the Associated General Contractors of America, say that one of the reasons for the increase is the current labor shortage. As more experienced workers leave the industry, less experienced workers are replacing them. This poses a challenge to safety on the job site, particularly when construction volume is up. Ladies and gentlemen, we ask you to please use peer keeping. Please keep an eye on the younger workers and please be safe.